Greetings again today in the name of Jesus Christ, our wonderful Lord and Savior. Good to see you here in the house of the Lord today in the Northside Baptist Church. We welcome every one of you, both members and visitors alike. May God bless you. We appreciate you being here. And you that's listening out in the radio listen audience, we most certainly appreciate you tuning in to Northside Baptist Church Hour, coming to you live right from the auditorium of the Northside Church here in Athens. And if you'll call a friend and have them to tune in, then we'll try to be a blessing to them as well. Most certainly appreciate you tuning in Sunday after Sunday and then through the week at 12 o'clock noon each day, Monday through Saturday. We're heard through the facilities of this great radio station. So we appreciate your presence, appreciate you tuning in. May God bless you. We're hoping and trusting the hour coming up can be a real inspiration. I want you to turn to the book of Genesis chapter 5. And the book of Hebrews chapter 11. Now the messages and the singing, the message brother and the singing will be on cassette tape. These tapes are available. And we send them out for a gift of $3 each. A gift is used to help to pray our radio expense. And we're going to speak today on the person that was not. The person that was not. Not a hard knot, a touch were not, an astronaut, but a was not. We'll be speaking about that person today. And you turn to Genesis 5 and Hebrews 11. Somebody heard a lady grumbling the other day and she was complaining, said she didn't know what in the world this world is ever coming to. Said somebody broke into her house and stole all of her holiday in towels. Well, that is bad. That'll sink in after a while, I'm sure. Now, the tape today is cassette tape number 12. Cassette tape number 212. I'm sorry, 212. And you can get these tape by number or by title. I have a list of more than 200 tapes I can send out to you. you just write in and say, Preach Edward, send me your list. So we have more than 200. We'd send you a list of at least 200 at your request. For all you people here in the auditorium and the radio audience as well, we still have some of our beautiful calendars. Be glad to send you these calendars at your request. Just come down and get them or write in for them. I have a few left here. They won't do any good here. We need to get them out where they can help to advertise our church and the radio uh, broadcast. Man called me last week and he was greatly exercised about the what happened in regard to the turning over the conviction of the all day family down in southwest Georgia. He'd called Atlanta five times trying to find the man that would get in the petition to impeach these knucklehead judges that overturned that conviction. I all I knew is the man by the name of Strickland from Decatur County, a contractor. That's all the information I could give. I wish I did have more. I'd like to get a number of signatures. These liberals ought to be impeached. They're not fit to be judges. And they should be impeached right away. And I think uh, a lot of people have exercised about this. And they probably going to get enough signatures. I hope so. I'd like to do all I can. I was glad to... No, last week over in the state of South Carolina, they finally had backbone and intestinal fortitude enough to go ahead and put a man to death in the electric chair that had helped kill a 16-year-old boy, raped a 14-year-old girl, mutilated the body, treated her worse than a dog, and of course killed her. They already executed one, and this was, I think, number two. That's exactly what they should have done. We've got to get some teeth in our law and our judicial system are we in bad, bad shape already, in bad shape already? And we need to do what God says in the book. He said, they that commit cold-blooded murder, their punishment is that they should be put to death. There's no argument whether it deters crime or not. We know it does for people that got sense enough to think it through. But uh, the Bible says their punishment is that they should be punished by death. That's what God said in the book. The Bible says, let God be true and every man a liar. You may say, preach Edward, I get tired hearing you talking about that. Well, I get tired of it taking place over the country. It may come home to you one of these days. Somebody may treat your family in that manner. And if that happened, you say, preach Edward, I wish you said more about it. 
Now Genesis chapter 5. And he that walked with God after he begat the through the 300 years, begat sons and daughters. All the days of Enoch were 360 and five years. Enoch walked with God and he was not, for God took him. The Bible said this man was not. He became a was not. Now in Hebrews chapter 11, the Bible says in verse 5, a faith in it was translated, should not see death, and was not found, because God had translated him, for before his translation had this testimony, that he pleased God. I want to speak today about the person that became a was not. Now we're sending a lot of astronauts up into the heavens. I know we have a lot of tertiary in the land. There's a lot of whatnots around doing a time of flowers blooming in your gardens. Of course, you have a lot of hard knots, and but this man became a was not. The person that became a was not. Now, why did this man become a was not? Now, this man is a type of the rapture of the church, like all the songs seem to blend into that line of thought today about the coming of the Lord. This man is a type of that group of people that will become was nots in the future. Now, if you're alive when Jesus comes, and you may be, you will become a was not. And of course, if you're not alive, those that will be alive in Christ when he comes will become was nots. Now, this man became a was not, and he set a pattern for all of us that might just be a was not, or those that will be a was not sometimes in the future. Now, the Bible plainly tells us that this man walked with God. He walked with God for over 300 years without a break. In a day when they didn't have a church on every corner, when they didn't have um, Bible colleges and institutions and, and didn't have Bibles, a complete Bible like we have today, and yet this man, because he believed in God, and exercised great faith, he walked with God and became that was not. Now, of course, we do know that if a person walks with God, he'll become stronger and stronger and grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ because the Bible tells us it speaks of spiritual progress in 1 Thessalonians 4, 1. Paul said you ought to walk to please God so you should abound more and more. You'll never grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ unless you do some walking with God. And this person that became a was not walked with God for 300 years, that many were surrendered to God. He agreed with God. The Bible says in Amos chapter 3 and verse 3, how can two walk together except they be agreed? Now, he had to agree with God. He didn't doubt God. He didn't question God. He agreed with God. And so if you walk with God, you have no time or sympathy with people that question the word of God. The thief on the cross said, if thou be the Christ, you come down and save us and save yourself. That big if landed him into hell. The other man said, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. He believed in Jesus and he went with Christ to paradise that very day. And so this man walked in the light he had. The Bible said if we walk in the light as he's in the light, we have fellowship one with another. The blood of Jesus Christ, God's son, cleanses us from all sin. So God expects us to do some walking with him because you might just pretty soon be a was not and you need to do that. We find people in the Bible that walk with God. God commanded them to walk with him, and they did. Abraham, for instance, and others in the Word of God, they walk with the Lord, and many people have walked with God, and there's no reason that we shouldn't walk with God because one of these days we're going to be a was not. We don't know how soon that time is coming. And then, number two, this man... This person that became a was not had a testimony that he pleased the Lord. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 5, he had this testimony that he pleased God. Now a lot of people today are more concerned about pleasing human beings than they are pleasing God. You have even some ministers today that's more concerned 
about pleasing the denominational overlords than they are pleasing God. Our primary responsibility is to please the Lord. Now we should be concerned about our brethren and we should appreciate the fact that uh, they uh, want to agree with us and go along with us, but if not, we are to please God regardless. And this man had a real testimony, a testimony he pleased God. Do you know any greater testimony? A lot of people kind of get the testimonies and testimony meetings all mixed up. Some time ago, a good sister jumped up and said, Praise God, I love these testaline meetings. Well, it might be like that sometimes, but it shouldn't be. It should be a testimony meeting, not a testaline meeting. And yet at the same time, you probably do have a lot of testaline meetings. But God knows and God wants to have a testimony that we please Him, regardless of what people might think about it. Back in the early years of my ministry as a young minister, I would go out and preach, and I had the opportunity to do so. And I would come in, and I would worry about it, and I'd ask my wife, I would say, Honey, you think maybe those people enjoyed that sermon? Do you think that was a pretty good message? Uh, what do you think about it? I just wonder if they uh, were pleased uh, with the message and enjoyed it. That kind of worried me. I didn't know any better in those days. And it bothered me for a period of time. But as I grew older, I got away from that. And now I've come to the place since I'm an old man. I've gotten to the place where I'm afraid I will please everybody. My responsibility and concern is not whether or not I please them or want to please them. I'm afraid I will please everybody. Now the Bible said, woe is the man everybody speaks well of. Now, when you get about uh, 20 years old, you wonder what the people think about you. And, of course, when you get 40 years old, you don't care what they think about you. And when you get 60 years old, you find out nobody thinks about you. So you might as well go ahead and do what you need to do and glorify God. Amen. Now, it takes a little good long while to learn that. It took Moses 120 years to learn his lesson. 40 years in Egypt, 40 years with his mother-in-law. That's a long time to spend with your mother-in-law. Forty years with his mother-in-law in the backside of Egypt, watching sheep for his father-in-law, and then uh, forty years leading God's people uh, through the wilderness. And God said, no, man, it's time uh, you were knocking off. I'm going to make you a was not. And so God carried him on in, and God buried him, and went on about his business. Now, this man had a testimony that he pleased God. Now, you need to be concerned about pleasing God, not Please the preacher. I know you'd like to please your pastor and what you do. That's well and good. But if you please God, chances are you please him and others. Those that love the Lord. So you please the Lord. I've run into problems like this. I had a teacher one time, one of my former pastors. She took a Sunday school class with about six little junior girls in it. And she got on fire for God and, and went out working and built that class up and I believe she built it up to 29 or either 39. She had a very large class and had won most of them to God. Came out weeping one Sunday morning and said, Pastor, I need to give them a class up. I said, why? She said, well, some of the older members here said that I haven't been here as long as they have and they haven't had a chance to, to teach a class and, and you put me in the class and uh, I don't think uh, I should keep it because... I don't want them to feel ill toward me about it. I said, how many did you have in that class when you took it? She said, six. I said, how many did you have this morning? I believe she said, 29. And I said, how many of those you win to God? She said, most of them. I said, you get back in there and teach that class and quit worrying about it. That's just the devil trying to discourage you. You please God and do what God wants you to do and God will take care of the people. And those tears are running down her cheeks and she smiled and she said, Pastor, if that's what you say, do, that's what I want to do. and want to do what God wants me to do. I said, just stay in there and stay with it and keep after it. Now, whenever God begins to bless you and you're successful in whatever you're doing, you're going to find somebody that's not going to like it. And that thing you call green-eyed jealousy, the terrible thing, it's, it's as uh, weak it is the grave and people get jealous of you. And if you listen to jealousy and jealous-hearted people, you'll throw up your hands and quit. 
And that's exactly what the devil wants. You just go ahead and serve God. I've never mattered anything in the ministry. I know that. I'm the least of all preachers. I know that. But God has given me the opportunity to be in my 38th year of daily broadcasting the gospel from the classic city of Athens, Georgia. And one of my battles among the brethren uh, since I've been in the ministry have been uh, jealousy. I don't know why they'd get jealous of me. Not all of them, of course, some of them. And when they became jealous of me, they began to fight against me and criticize me and talk about me, run me down and things like that. Of course, that disturbed me because I couldn't see why in the world that some would be jealous of a little fellow like me. I could understand why they'd be jealous maybe of some great preacher uh, like uh, Evangelist Oliver B. Green is going to be with the Lord. Great men like that, but a, a little too before a country fellow like me, why would they want to be jealous of my ministry? But I've run into that in my ministry, but thank God you have some men that are big enough and strong enough as God's men that appreciates my feeble efforts and tell me so, and they're praying for me, and they say, Preach it, keep on. Get after them, stay with it. We are with you and for you. But I don't care who you are and what profession you're in, you're going to find somebody that'll get jealous of you. I don't care what kind of profession. It doesn't necessarily have to be the ministry. But uh, somebody get jealous of what you do. And of course, they are going to try to down you. And by trying to tear you down, they think they're building themselves up. But they're dead wrong. Now, you're to please God. Shut your ears to criticism. Don't let people uh, discourage you. And be sure you have a testimony that you please the Lord. That's what this man did. He didn't care what those fellows in that day said about him. He had a testimony he pleased God. And then he was a man that could deal in prophecy and believe very strongly in the coming of the Lord. Even in a day whenever they had no complete Bible, even in a day when Jesus had not come the first time, this man was a staunch believer in the second coming of Jesus Christ. Now he was criticized for that. Now I've seen the day when I have and other preachers that believe in the premillennial return of Jesus Christ have been greatly criticized by the post and the Armillenius and those that don't know what the Bible teaches about it. We can't let that phase us. The Bible says in the little book of Jude, verses 14 and 15, that this man that became a was not was a strong believer in the second coming of the Lord. He said, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. That's his second coming. That's yet in the future. That's not the rapture. That's his second coming back down to the earth of Christ. And he believed in that. Strong believer. And then he believed in the coming judgment. And he talked about it. People don't like to hear about the judgment. They want you to tickle their ears, scratch their backs, and don't tell them about their judgment in the face and as point of men wants to die, and after that, the judgment about their sins, they don't want to hear that. If you'll tickle their ears, scratch their backs, and brag on them, and tell them how wonderful they are, then they'll think well of you. But the man of God must preach judgment. He must preach on meat in due season, which is the coming of the Lord. He must feed God's people. He must do that because he's to face God. Someone said the preacher ought to preach as though God was sitting out there on the front pew every time he comes to the pulpit. Well, whether you can see God literally or not on the uh, front pew, you can't do that. But he's usually present in the person of the Holy Spirit. So when we preach or teach or sing, we should remember the Lord's in the audience. And if you remember the Lord's in the audience, then you need to try to do your best. Try to prepare. You know, singers need to uh, practice and, and uh, on their songs and try to uh, better themselves. And teachers should teach the uh, study the Sunday school lesson to try to be a good teacher. The preacher should study the Word of God. The Bible says he must study. A call to preach is a call to study. And everyone that has a part in the work of God should try to be their best. And remember when they come to the platform, the Lord is out there listening. And you don't want to do it in a haphazard kind of a way. You need to do your best and, and uh, train yourself and study and prepare.
to do your best for God. Even some singers will learn about uh, three or four or five songs and say, well, they'll do me the rest of my life and try to sing maybe for years and years, just maybe four or five songs, that's all. Never try to learn any more or learn them any better. You have them like you have some preachers. They say, well, all I need to do is just um, get up in the pulpit, open my mouth, and God will fill it. Yeah, you're right. He'll fill it all right with hot air. Now, God said for you to study. The man of God is to study. A man that won't study is not fit to try to preach or teach God's people a pastor a church. A call to the ministry is a call to study the Word of God. The Bible is clear on that. And this man believes strongly in judgment and in the coming of the Lord, and he pleased the Lord. Then this man that became a was not was a man that absolutely uh, was lifted from the earth, translated and transmigrated right on up into heaven. He was walking with God, and the Bible says as he walked with God in Hebrews 11:5. Then he just kept walking and kept walking and kept walking and, and finally ended up in heaven. Isn't that something? A man on the earth walking with God and just walked right straight into heaven. We find another man in the Bible that was caught into heaven and went up into, in a fiery chariot and horse to find a whirlwind. And that man was Elijah. They went to heaven without dying. Now, as all these singers this morning sing these songs about the coming of the Lord, this message, this man, that was a was not, and Elijah, they are both types of the rapture of the church. One of these days, the Lord will come back, and some people will go out without dying. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and verse 51, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, we shall all be changed. Verse 52, in a moment, the twinkling eye. Now, this great mystery was revealed to the Apostle Paul. Now, the second coming of Jesus Christ down to the earth was no mystery. Brother Enoch knew about that and believed that and preached that. The second coming of Christ, that was no mystery. Some of the Old Testament preachers referred to the second coming of the Lord all through the Old Testament. That was no mystery. But when God saved the Apostle Paul, God said, Paul... I'm going to give you a mystery. I'll show you something that I want you to put in the Bible and reveal to God's people. It's a great mystery. It's been hid all the years from the beginning. It's now come time for you to manifest and let it be known. And that mystery is the catching out of the saints of God at, at what we call the rapture. And the rapture of the church is catching out of the believers when Jesus comes. First Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 17. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Now when the rapture takes place, God will bring out of the grave all the bodies of the saints of God that died in Christ. And then when God gets them to the top of the ground out of the grave, all of a sudden it's going to translate, transmigrate all the born again believers, all those in Christ, and they'll be caught up together with those who are in the grave, and you'll go out together to meet Jesus in the air. It ever occur to you if you have a loved one in heaven and you go at the rapture, the next time you see your loved one will be between the grave and the clouds. That's why you'll see them. You're going to be caught out with them as they come out of the grave. God will bring that body out, glorify that body, and you'll be caught up with your loved one to meet Jesus in the clouds, in the air. Now, when Jesus comes at the rapture, he's not coming down to the earth. He'll not plant his feet on the Mount of Olives at this time. He's coming in the air, and he'll catch out the believing ones, resurrect, first of all, the saints of God who died in the faith, They'll be caught out to meet Jesus in the air. That is the great mystery. And Paul gave it to us in the Bible. And that's something you need to appreciate and look forward to because you may never die. Now, there's a little dread, no doubt, to a lot of people about this thing called death. You just kind of hate to think about it. 
you don't want to think about it, and maybe you try not to think about it, but it never occur to you that you might not die, that you may be one that will be caught out to rapture? I believe we're that close. I really do. I believe we're that close to the rapture. I also believe in 1948 on May the 14th at 5 o'clock in the afternoon, when the nation of Israel was recognized, united into a nation, uh, by the United Nations, that is claimed to be a set in order. Uh, Jesus said in Matthew 24 and verse 32, uh, he said, Now remember the putting forth the leaves, the bud, and the fig tree, when his branch yet ten and fifth relation of some is nine, he said, This generation shall not pass. I believe with all my heart, you can disagree if you want to, but I believe with all my heart that uh, when that little nation came into existence, that was the putting forth of the little leaves of the fig tree. And he said, this generation shall not pass away. Lord, these things be fulfilled. And I firmly believe that to some people that were alive on May the 14th, 1948, at 5 o'clock in the afternoon in American time, when they were alive then, will be alive when the Lord comes. I believe that. Now you may say, preach Edwards, doesn't the Bible say don't, uh, said in today's, well, the Bible says we know not the day nor the hour. That is, we know not the 60 minute period of the 24 hour period of the time of his coming. We might say the Lord will be back here in 60 minutes. It might be an hour and a half before he came. We might say the Lord will be here in 24 hours. It might be 25 hours before he got here. See, we are not to set the day nor the hour, but the Bible says not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together and exhorting one another and that much the more as ye see that day approaching. As a child of God, you can see that day approaching. The Bible says we're not children of darkness, we're children of light, that that day will overtake us on a way. And if you know anything about the Bible, occurred events, beloved, you'll have to admit that we're living right down near the end of the age. The Bible says that it was in days of Noah, and in that day the land was filled with violence. There's never been a time when so much violence and sex is fed from TV in the minds of people as in this hour in which we live. You'll go as crazy as a bat if you try to watch TV programs today, hour in and hour out. You need to be careful what you look at. They are filled with violence from the beginning to the end. It's terrible. All kind of crime and violence and sex mentioned on TV. And uh, young people listen to rock music and stuff of that type. No wonder this world's gone crazy. Beloved, we, the devil is about to drive this human race mad and about to drive this human race into hell. You need to realize the coming of the Lord draws nigh. Not only rock music, but all kind of music. They got some of the most terrible country music today I ever heard in my life. Not fit for my bird dog to listen to. If I was a disc jockey, I'd pick out some decent songs uh, to play, good, decent country music. Not some of this stuff today is so suggestive, uh, getting on fire in the back seat and all that kind of stuff. That's not fit for the devil to listen to, let alone the human race. And some even worse than that, suggestive stuff. And uh, it, it's terrible. Rock, country, and all kind of music today or that kind of special those two kinds the devil is absolutely taking over and trying to run the human race and their minds through that kind of junk now there's some good music and good music is appreciated and and uh, i appreciate good music but i can't listen to a lot of this junk today i'd go as crazy as a fly i couldn't stand it i can't look at a lot of this crazy stuff on TV today, I'd go crazy. I don't see how a lot of young people can sit there and watch that kind of stuff. I don't see either. People sit there hour after hour after hour and look at all that crime and some of those crazy things that take place and shown on TV or heard on radio today, and that's bad. And I'm telling you the truth. You, you may say, preacher, I don't like it. Well, I can't help that. I, I'm a preacher, and I must face God, and I must tell you the truth, and I'm not going to apologize but what I say, and I'm telling you the truth, and if you think a few minutes, to be honest, you'll find out I'm telling you the truth. And so we see then that that time is coming, and this man that was not jumped over the uh, funeral home in the cemetery. Many leapfrogged both of them. He, he didn't go to the 
the mortuary, he did not go to the cemetery. He went straight on into heaven and bypassed both of them. And you may be in that number that do that very thing. And the Bible said this man went home to be with God. He went to spend the day with God. And the Bible said there's no night there, so he's still spending the day. If you went somewhere to spend the day and you didn't uh, judge by your clock and you just waited to judge by the darkness had come and the darkness didn't come, uh, you'd have a right, I guess, to stay until the darkness came. Now this man, he went to spend the day with God and the night didn't come up there, so he's still spending the day with God. And that's been many thousand years ago. And one of these days, you two will go home and you'll find yourself walking in white, Revelation 3, 4, and they walk with me in white. And you'll find yourself spending the day with God and there's no night there. Now, if you're not saved and Jesus should come today, you'd be left here. But if Jesus came today, you will become a was not like this man I talked about. You need to be ready. That's a man one time that gathered his little boy along with some of the neighbor's children and carried him to the circus. They went to the circus and they went around over the circus and, and there uh, they saw a lot of things. Wasn't like the woman whose little boy worried about going to the circus and she carried him to the circus and the time he stepped through the gate he started screaming when he saw the animals and she said you worried me to come to the circus and, and you're going to enjoy every foot of the circus if I have to whip you every foot of the way. But it wasn't like that with this man. He carried the people into the circus, little boys, and the thing caught on fire. And he managed to get the children out and out of danger. And as he checked the group, he found out that his little boy was missing. And uh, he was hysterical. And he attempted to run back into the fire to see if he could find him. He was really shaken up. And he began to weep. And he told the other little boys, let's go to the car. And so they went to the automobile. And lo and behold, what did he see? He saw his own little boy sitting there in the car. And he said, Daddy, you told me if I ever got lost, anything happened for me to come to the car. And said, when that thing caught on fire, Daddy, I, I ran to the car. And his father was so glad that he little boy obeyed him and did what he told him to do. Now, you parents need to tell your children that the rapture is going to take place. And it may be in their lifetime. It may be in your lifetime. And if they are not ready, they won't leave here. They'll be left here for the rule of the Antichrist and the judgment and wrath of God. But if they are ready, they'll go with you to meet Jesus in the air. And you need to tell them about the rapture. You don't want your family divided. We had a man one time, member of this church, and maybe listening today. He thought the rapture had taken place, raised the window one night, looked down the road and see if there's any cars coming by. And he's scared to death. He thought the rapture had taken place for some reason or another. Well, it should kind of shake us up. We need to realize that that's going to take place. It may take place today. And I hope that you'll be ready. This message and singing music's on tape 212. My mailing address is Virgil Edwards, P.O. Box 501 Athens, Georgia, 30603. You can write in and get it if you desire. Let us all stand to our feet. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank Thee for the hope we have in Christ we know one of these days, Lord, we're going to become a was not like this man we preached about. God help us to sojourn that will be pleasing in thy sight ere we become a was not before thee. Have you in this invitation, I pray in Christ's name. Amen. Debbie's going to play for us on the instrument. Now, if you're here and you're not saved, or you're backslidden on God, or you're looking for a church home, you want to come down and join this church where we receive members. You may come while she plays a couple of stanzas. Would you obey God if you're not saved or backslidden? Or you want to join this church? Would you come? While we wait, you know whether or not you're right with God. And you alone know more than anyone else about that. You know whether or not God has spoken to you. Would you come? speaking to you now obey the Lord that's all I'm asking you to do obey God
God will not save anybody against their will. You can't help anyone that's not willing to be helped. And I brought the messages up to you. Obey and respond.